All right then, so the last little bit of chapter seven that we have to do concerns valence electrons and how those valence electrons all ultimately work and operate. So we're gonna talk about two things today. We're gonna to talk about the idea of what a valence electron is and what it is not. And we're gonna talk about some trends that we can draw from the periodic table based upon the position of an atom on the table in terms of, is it at the top of a column or the bottom of a column? Is it to the left of the row or the right of the row? We'll start with valence electrons. Valence electrons concern the last filled energy level. So what we mean by that is if you can think to those electron configurations that we wrote, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, as would be the case for um, fluorine. The electrons that exist in the second energy level would be considered valence electrons. Those are the electrons that are in the outermost energy level and are furthest away from the nucleus as a result. So in total, we would look at this and say that there are a total of seven valence electrons for this particular atom. These other two electrons, the ones that are in the inner energy level, or in the case of some others, inner energy levels, these would be referred to as core electrons. Electrons that are closest to the nucleus and are kind of shielded from the outside world by all the electrons that are out in front of it. Now these core electrons really don't have a whole lot to do in the atom. They are primarily there to keep the atom balanced in charge and to stabilize it in that kind of way. But when it comes to chemical bonding, they have very little to do. They are too well protected from other atoms to participate in any kind of bonding. And so it is the valence electrons that are gonna be the primary focus of our discussion for today and when we talk about bonding in chapter eight. Now, luckily, based upon how we draw out our periodic table and how we look at it, determining the number of valence electrons in a given element is relatively straightforward. Because, again, if we think about the configurations, keep in mind that the electrons in this zone are all one energy level below. And all the electrons in this zone are all two energy levels below. Then our valence electrons are really determined by what we would call the main group elements, the main group electrons. And so this periodic table does not show but if you have a periodic table that looks like this, what you'll see on that periodic table is something called the chemical abstract service, the CAS numbering system. Now, if your periodic table has one through 18 up on the top, like that one on the wall does, 
That's called the IUPAC system. That is the International Union of Physical and Applied Chemistry. You don't need to know what that is, but basically they are the worldwide governing body of chemistry. And that's how they arrange it. CAS, the Chemical Abstract Service, is a North American based system that splits it off basically into your main group elements that have all these A designations on them and your transition metals that have all of these B designations. Now we don't need to get into why the Bs are the Bs and what, what they mean. But if you see this here, what you should recognize is that group 1A represents all of the elements that have one valence electron. Group 2A here represent all of the elements that have two valence electrons. Group 3A represent all the elements that have three valence electrons. And so on, all the way to the noble gases, group 8A, which have eight valence electrons with the exception of helium, which only has two because the first energy level only requires two. And so the IUPAC table does not do this, but what we do have in the IUPAC table is these elements here are in groups 13 through 18. And so if we just subtract 10 off of their column number, we arrive at the same conclusion. Group 13 has three valence electrons. Group 17 has seven valence electrons. Group 18 has eight valence electrons and so forth all the way down the line on that list. And so to that end, we can use that information to really help us to tell how many valence electrons are in an element just by looking at where it is on the periodic table. So if I have an example like this, how many valence electrons are in bromine? Well, there's two ways that you can determine that. The first way, you can look at the, the electron configuration like it's given here. And if you do that, you go, okay, what's my biggest energy level? Okay, that'd be four. I've got 4s2, 4p5. 2 plus 5, that means that there are seven valence electrons in that substance. But I can do the same thing if I go to my periodic table and recognize that bromine is a halogen right here in group 7, 7a, group 17, and I would get the same exact answer that way as well. So from an electron configuration standpoint, yes, we do have this available. We can pick out valence electrons out of the configuration and just say, okay, how many electrons are in that outermost energy level? But if I don't have that, I don't have to recreate it. I can just look at the periodic table and say, okay, where is it? And based on what column it is in, I can determine the number of electrons that way. So let's do a couple more examples of this. And again, we're going to use the periodic table here instead of configurations because once we start using the table for this function, it becomes way easier to use it that way then to sit there and go, okay, fluorine, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, 2s2, 2p5, that's seven electrons. Instead of doing that, I can look at the table and say, okay, fluorine's in the halogens, that's group 17. Group 17 has seven valence electrons. I can look at lithium. Lithium is element number three. It is in the alkali metals, group one. 
it will have one valence electron. Sodium. Sodium is directly under lithium, element number 11, group one, alkali metals. It also has one valence electron. Carbon, carbon element number six, group 14 or group 4A, depending upon the table you're looking at. Either way you look at it, four valence electrons. So what I want you to do, take just a couple of minutes here, figure out the answer for silicon and for lead. If you don't have a periodic table, you can either look to the, your right, or if you want me to bring you a paper copy, uh, just put your hand up, I'll bring one to you. Looks like we're all in the same place in the room here. The answers to both silicon and lead were four. And so this speaks to a general property overall. We saw this on Friday. Elements in the same column in the same family have similar electron configurations, which is one of the reasons why they have similar kinds of chemical properties. And we can tie their properties to their electron configurations, to the way that those electrons are arranged. And so we're moving from the very specific idea of an electron configuration to this more generalized idea of valence electrons overall. All right, any questions so far? All right, so we're gonna put a pin in the idea of valence electrons. Starting on Wednesday, when we talk about chemical bonding, we're gonna come back to that because what we are going to find is that the number of valence electrons that are present in a given element speak a lot to the kind of bonding that it undergoes. We're gonna get into something called the octet rule that helps to explain a lot of that. And that, but that's a, that's a topic for chapter eight. That's a topic for, for Wednesday. We're going to start talking now about some periodic properties. And we're going to get into three general ideas. One of them is the idea of reactivity. Another one is called ionization energy. And that is the ability or the tendency of an atom to want to lose electrons. And then the third one is something your book calls atomic radius or atomic radii. We're just going to kind of call it size. How big is the atom? 
how can we tell an atom to be bigger or smaller than another? So let's start with reactivity. Now, the first trend we're going to look at concerns something called the activity series. Now, with the activity series, we saw this for the first time in our previous discussion of equation balancing. Single replacement reactions fall suspect to this idea of activity. An element down here at the bottom of the activity series is not going to replace an element that is up high on the activity series. It's not able to, it's not reactive enough. What we see instead in single replacement reactions are these elements kicking out these other ones because they are more reactive. And so that's why we see, if you look at the top of this list, potassium, barium, strontium, calcium, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, these are all metals that are quite reactive. And especially you see in here a lot of alkali metals from group one and a lot of alkaline earth metals from group two. So the higher up on this table we are, the more reactive those metals tend to be. The lower it is on the table, the less reactive those metals tend to be. And we kind of reference everything in terms of hydrogen. Hydrogen sits there kind of in the middle because hydrogen is the primary component of water and the primary component of acids when it comes to their reactivities. So what we find as interesting is these metals down here are relatively corrosion resistant. Meaning if I put those metals in the presence of an acid, a general acid, they tend not to react unless that acid happens to have a particular oxidizing power in addition to being just an acid. So you look at some of those things on that list and you go, oh, okay, that makes sense. Why is jewelry made out of silver, gold, platinum, palladium? Well, if you look at it on the bottom of this list, it doesn't react with acid, which means as it interacts with your body, your skin, it's not going to corrode. It's not going to react. It's low reactivity makes it really valuable as a precious metal. Why don't we tend to see a whole lot of stuff made out of nickel and cobalt and iron? Well, same reason in reverse. Those are more reactive metals. They can react with stuff that you just kind of generate. If you've ever sweated a day in your life, you'll notice that your sweat has a little bit of an acidity to it. If you took the pH of it, it'd come out a little bit acidic. Well, that would play a pretty key role in de degrading anything that was on your skin at that time. That's why you got to be really careful with things like uh, Fitbits. Some of the metals that are used in those can react with certain types of skin. You ever had a Fitbit rash? Got one of those things on your, uh, happens to a lot of people. Why? The metal that is used to make those electrodes reacts with certain types of skin. So you have to be real careful about it. You have to use certain kinds of guards or things to help you with that so that your skin doesn't flare up every time you put on your watch. I've got that problem too. That's why I wear mine around my waist. Doesn't do much for my heart rate, but it certainly counts my steps still. But that's all in the same discussion. 
When it comes to reactivity, there are two general trends. There's a trend for metals and there's a trend for non-metals. The trend for metals is this. As you go down the table and toward the left, the metals get more reactive. So your alkali metals are the most reactive. Your alkaline earths are the next most reactive. Your transition metals and others tend to be less reactive than those. The further you go down the table, the more reactive that they get. For nonmetals, it's pretty much the same trend, but in complete opposite. Instead of down into the left, we're talking about up into the right. As you go up a series of nonmetals, they get more reactive. As you go to the right, they get more reactive as well. And so the halogens are your most reactive nonmetals followed by the oxygen group, followed by the nitrogen group. And within those groups, bromine's less reactive than chlorine. Chlorine's less than reactive than fluorine. Sulfur's less reactive than oxygen. Oxygen's pretty darn reactive, but it's not nearly as reactive as fluorine. The obvious exception to that particular trend, the noble gases. The noble gases don't react at all. Really, the only time we can get a noble gas to react is if it's big enough and we basically force enough fluorine with it that the fluorine's reactivity kind of overcomes the noble gas's inactivity. Right. Any questions with regard to reactivity trends? Okay. Let's talk about atomic size. Now, atomic size, I know ionization energy was the second thing on the list, but here's the thing. If we can understand size, Generally speaking, ionization energy and size are inversely related. The smaller an atom is, the harder it is to take electrons from it. The bigger it is, the easier it is to take electrons from it. So if we can understand the idea of size, we can kind of flip that around to figure out how it, easily we can take electrons from it. Now this particular slide here is talking about the official definition of atomic size. And I'll admit, this is, this is a bit confusing because what we base our, our discussion of atomic size on is when this something reacts, how big is the chemical bond? What is the distance between the two nuclei of that particular chemical bond? And then we take whatever that distance is and we cut it in half. For our purposes here, I want to simplify that. We can think of atomic size as this the distance from the nucleus to the farthest electron. Is it the truest, accurate, most well-designed definition? No. Does it make sense? Can we kind of figure out what that looks like though? Can we picture that a little bit better? I think so. We're talking about a distance. How far is it from the nucleus to that last electron? That's what we're gonna measure as atomic radius or atomic size. So if I can figure that out, that's really all I need to know. So 
Here are the data. Let's see if we can figure out the trends based upon what these data are telling us. So is there any trend vertically within a group? Adria? Um, it gets okay, very good. Okay, pretty simple. It's you know, when you see it visually like that, you can see it's pretty consistent. Doesn't matter what group you look at, they all tend to follow that same way. What about, what about side to side? Is there a general side to side trend? Row six may not be the best place to look for this. Let's look more like in row two. Go ahead. They're getting smaller. Now, one thing that we will notice about this particular trend, in the columns, it's pretty consistent. In the rows, as our energy levels start to increase, the differences become a lot more nuanced. They're a lot more subtle. General speaking though, atomic size is going to decrease from left to right in a row or period. And that's it. Those are the two general trends for size. Now notice, we haven't said anything about the transition metals. We haven't said anything about the lanthanides or actinides. Why are we leaving them out of the conversation? Because the trends aren't as pronounced there. In fact, when we include them, it gets a lot more muddy. It's not nearly as uh, well defined. But those are the two general trends. Now, here are the whys. Why does this happen? Well, as we go down a group, what are we adding? We're adding more energy levels. And the more energy levels that we add, the further those electrons are gonna get away from the nucleus. And that's gonna make the whole atom bigger. So as we add energy levels, those electrons get further and further away, and that makes the atom bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, what about as we go across? Well, in that case, we have the same number of energy levels. If I look at period three, I have three energy levels. The only difference between sodium and magnesium and silicon and phosphorus is the fact that those three energy levels are being attracted by different nuclei. In sodium, the nucleus has 11 protons. In magnesium, the nucleus has 12 protons. In silicon, it has 14 protons. As we go across, that nucleus has more and more protons, which means it's gonna have a greater charge. 
a greater charge is going to attract those extra electrons and bring them in closer. So the only thing that we saw as different within a row was that charge, that level of attraction between the nucleus and its electrons. Those were the only things that we saw different. Everything else was effectively the same. And if you look at the trend again, look at the numbers. Look at how much it's changing once we go from metal to non-metal. To go from energy level to energy level, we see a difference in size. This one, this one increases by 60, this one increases by 40, this one increases by 35, this one increases by 30. If I go across, decreased by eight, decreased by two, decreased by two, decreased by one, decreased by one. Changing energy levels has a big impact on size. Adding protons to the nucleus, increasing the charge of that nucleus has a much smaller effect on the size. They get brought in gradually as opposed to these big steps. So let's do some examples. Which has the larger atomic radius, magnesium or calcium? I go to my periodic table. I see that magnesium and calcium are in the same group. Magnesium has three energy levels. Calcium has four. Calcium is going to be the larger of the two. Oxygen or fluorine? I look. Oxygen and fluorine are next to each other on the periodic table. Oxygen has eight electron or eight protons. Fluorine has nine. So fluorine's got more charge, which means it's going to pull the electrons in more. Oxygen's going to be bigger. <clears throat> All right, this one's a little bit more tricky. Sulfur and fluorine. They're not in the same row. They're not in the same column. How do I compare them? Well, I have to see if I can compare them to something common. So let's answer this question. Sulfur or oxygen? Which one's going to be the bigger? All right, Lana says sulfur. Anyone else want to chime in? It is sulfur. So If sulfur is bigger than oxygen and oxygen is bigger than fluorine, then sulfur has to be bigger than fluorine. So if I cannot make a direct comparison, I can use the transitive property and make a similar comparison and see how it stacks up. So I compared oxygen and fluorine here. I compared sulfur and oxygen there. That led me to the answer that sulfur had to be bigger. Any last questions about atomic radius?
Okay, so this last concept is something called ionization energy. With ionization energy, we are talking about how much energy does it take to remove an electron from an atom. And the trend overall is that if I have an atom that is small, it's going to have its electrons held tightly because they are close to the nucleus. If I have an atom that is large, it's going to hold their electrons loosely because those valence electrons are so far away from the nucleus that they are impacted less and held less than the nucleus by the nucleus than others. So what we have here is a reverse trend. As my size increases, my ionization energy decreases and vice versa. That's why we talked about size first. Because the trend here is a reverse one. If I can understand what the, what the relationship between size and energy is, if I know how to evaluate size, I can reverse the logic to figure out energy. All right, this is your trends table. Again, there's a lot more complication with ionization energy than with others. We can see in general, again, this is in general, as we go as we go down a column, we know that size increases, ionization energy we can see pretty clearly decreases. And that's pretty well true all the way across the table. Just like we saw with the trend in atomic size. Go across the table, as long as you're going down the column, you see the size increases and therefore ionization energy decreases. Going across, it's a little bit more complex. We can see that there's a general trend, but that general trend has some bumps in the road. We're not gonna concern ourselves with the bumps, but the general trend, as we know, our size is decreasing as we go from left to right. And the general trend is that the ionization energy is going up. Again, there are some spots along the way where we see that it dips and then goes back up, dips and then goes back up. We're not gonna concern ourselves with those. What we are gonna concern ourselves with is the general trend. And the general trend is that if we know that the size is decreasing, we know that the ionization energy is going to increase as a result. And this should make some sense to us in terms of what kinds of ions do we tend to see on this part of the periodic table? We're talking about the, the P block. Those are mostly nonmetals. What kinds of ions are formed by nonmetals generally? Positive or negative? negative. So these are the kinds of elements that like to add electrons. This isn't adding electrons. This is taking them away. So you're asking these elements to basically do the reverse of what they're supposed to do. And it takes more energy to do that.
All right, let's look at a couple of examples here. Same examples as we saw in the size trend. For ionization energy, we are looking relationally at magnesium versus calcium. Calcium is the larger of the two. So magnesium is going to require more energy In letter B, we determined that oxygen was the larger, so fluorine is going to be the smaller and have the larger ionization energy. Part C, we can do a similar kind of comparison. If I compare sulfur versus oxygen, Oxygen would have a greater ionization energy than sulfur because it is bigger or smaller. Oxygen is a smaller energy than fluorine, so fluorine would have the greater energy of the three. Last concept that we'll bring in here has to do with ions, and it's just a simple idea. When we add electrons, it makes, the, it makes the atom bigger. When we take electrons away, it makes the atom smaller. So when we look at cations, for example, cations where we've got an element, we've ripped an electron away from it, it's now positively charged, it's smaller than it once was. Anions, on the other hand, if we add an electron, if we add an electron to an existing atom, the extra repulsion from that extra electron is going to make the atom bigger overall because it's going to negate some of the effect of the nucleus. All right, any questions with regard to any of these trends? All right, that concludes for us chapter seven. We will start chapter eight on Wednesday. Have a good afternoon.